Um, this is a session about data de-identification in uh, you know, your healthcare environment, uh, in your software delivery lifecycle. Uh, my name is Dan Kinzer. Uh, I am currently with uh, CDPHP, Capital District Physicians Health Plan out of Albany, New York. Um, I've been in healthcare IT for 20 plus years. I actually worked at Trizetto uh, for about 11 years in the application managed services area. So knew a lot about what's going on. Most of my time has been coming with facets, but I do head back home at QNext. Um, I worked at Molina Healthcare, at Kaiser Permanente, and a number of other health plans. And um, you know, that's a little bit about myself. I've been at CPHP for a couple of years, and uh, you know, this is a conversation about the, what we went through when implementing data data identification our lowers. Steve? Yeah, Steve Sedaris. I'm with SourceEdge. We were the partners who implemented the de-identification with uh, CDPHP. Uh, just a little bit about me, about 35 years of uh, overall IT experience, 30 years uh, working specifically with databases, database technologies, database architecture, de-identification, all that fun stuff. So thank you guys all for joining. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to read through the agenda, but just high level, we're going to talk about data de-identification, a couple of terms, why we did it, talk about the requirements around our solution. See, come in, see. Um, the implementation process, and there'll be time. Interject at any time with questions. This is very free form, and we're happy to talk to you guys afterwards if you have any other questions. So we'll... So the, what we want to do first is when we start talking about masking and data de-identification, it's important to understand terminology first and foremost. So when we think about masking, masking by definition is just obfuscating the data. So it doesn't really have any value but it does protect, but that also means if it doesn't have any value, you really can't use it. Encryption is another term that's often used when people talk about protecting their data, but encryption really protects the data at, its, at rest. It doesn't really, again, protect you from someone who has access to the data to really do anything with it. Then what we're focusing on here is data de-identification. So the key aspects here are the data is permanently changed, and the key aspect that we want to focus on in, in addition to that is that it's a one-way algorithm. In order to truly protect your data, we want to make sure that it can only be de-identified and that there's no key to reverse that. Otherwise, you really haven't truly protected your data. We want to make sure that at the end of it, that nothing that is left can be used to go back to what is original. And again, unlike masking, this is real data. So it's real data that you can use, real data that simulates what's going on in your environment so that it can be useful for your testing, whatever aspects it may take. So why and why not? So there are things that are out there. For example, this facets encryption. But as we just discussed, encryption in and of itself doesn't allow you to inherently protect your production level data. If you have offshore developers, if you have encryption, that's great, but it doesn't protect your offshore developers from seeing sensitive data that you may be on the restricted. Yeah, exactly. Um, it doesn't, all, it also may not cover all the requirements for HIPAA that would allow you to protect this data and cover it. Now, synthetic data, that's another option that you have. And it can be a solution that you implement. However, with synthetic data, most often you're not replicating the complexity and the volume that you have in your production level systems. You're doing it to give you some small subset. So that creates some, some, uh, some com complication. It also has to be created from scratch. So now you're starting from zero and you're trying to get it to be smart enough to get you to where you already are with your production data. The identified data is guaranteed to address the volume and complexity of your data. So you now have, once you have that in your environments, you now can use it and you have the confidence that as you're going through your testing and your evaluation or your development, that you have reasonably covered the complex scenarios that you have in your production data. It removes the sensitive data, but leaves the complexity in place and more importantly, it meets the HIPAA compliance. The thing that we have to remember is the production of the, in the lower environments is a significant risk. And we have uh, on the next page, I think is 
really covers some of the several breaches that have occurred as a result of that. So this is something that your organization really needs to think about as far as exposing your sensitive data, especially with the globalization of resources to make sure that it's truly protected. Exactly. And I think this is where, from a CDPHP standpoint, we came in and said, listen, we want to we want to have the protections of having the identified data. We want to ensure that, you know, when we have offshore resources accessing data, that they are not seeing production data unless it's absolutely necessary or we have the right permissions to do so. We also wanted to address concerns around potential data breaches because the more instances of your production data you have, the more opportunities there are for that to be exposed. I'm not going to go through these, but these are all health plans or patient data that have been exposed primarily through breaches in, in non-production environments, you know, access, inappropriate access, copying data, et cetera. I know I personally worked at a plan one time where the director of IT got let go because he copied a whole bunch of member data to his laptop to do some testing with or something and then lost his laptop um, with it unlocked. And so there's things like that that can happen and the less data that you have out there, the better off you are. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. So we had some considerations that we really made important to us. And, you know, these are ones that you have to decide your organization, but we wanted to make sure the process was repeatable. And what that means is we did not want to have a situation where you mass the data and you built all these test cases. And then you, when you refresh the data, you had to go and do a whole new set and go whole new test cases. So that was important to us that this is a repeatable process and that flat files and databases and APIs, all that data was coming in and getting de-identified the same way every time so that there was a unified system that worked just like production would. Uh, the other one was the process is timely. We wanted to ensure that each process executed in the appropriate time frame so that we didn't have these long delays. Oh, yeah, you can test, but you're going to have to wait 48 hours for us to run a file through and get it processed from you alone to the system. Um, you know, we, we have a little bit of timing here, larger files under an hour for, you know, uh, enrolled under claims files. Small small files take a couple of minutes, but we wanted to make sure that the overall impact of the SDLC process was either zero or close to zero. In other words, people saw this as a process that worked basically the same way as it did when they had regular un-de-identified data. Uh, production like and complexity and volume, that's around making sure people have confidence. Anytime you give people a small sum set, the first thing that'll word is, well, how do I know this is gonna work the same way in prod? I got 500,000 members in prod and you give me, you know, 50,000 members, I, I just don't know if this is going to work the same way. So you end up with that volume complexity issue. And lastly, about migrating across the environments, we wanted to ensure that that com complex data could be put into every environment and that we wouldn't have to have delays. And it's important that if I build a test case in this environment, in my dev environment, and then I move it to my SID environment, my test cases are the same. The member that I'm looking for is the same, everything, just like prod only it's a de-identified member. So Dan Kinzer in production becomes Steve Sedaris in the test environment, Steve Sedaris in the SID environment, Steve Sedaris in the pre-production environment, they're all the same. And that was a key element. Uh, the one piece that we touched on briefly was, um, and he mentioned at the beginning, but I'll touch on again, non-reversible. We did not want a system by which somebody could get a key or uh, of some kind and reverse engineer the data. So if you got the data and you got the key, then you would have all the data anyway. We wanted to make sure. Um, and that was one of our key requirements as well, that it was non-reversible. Um, so from a data perspective, um, we looked at this. This is mine still, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we, we really wanted to make sure, like you said, the consistency. Name, regardless of the name, if the name is the same name, it's going to be masked to the same value elsewhere. Now, I know that sounds like, well, if it's always masked the same way, you know what it is. But from a volume perspective, you're loading in hundreds of thousands of, of names. Well, they're going to mask, but unless somebody like actively goes through the process of like loading, taking one record and masking it, it's impossible to go back and find a name in the database and figure out what it was in reality. And by the way, for those of you taking pictures, we this presentation will be available for download. So if you want it, you don't need to take pictures unless you want to. Because uh, I know without, without, the picture you don't get seen and I in the pick frame, which is probably why you're taking it. <laughs> it is. Uh, mostly. Anyway, um, <laughs> but we did want to make sure that we had consistency across the files, uh, formats, et cetera, whether it be Salesforce or facets or EDM or whatever. We wanted to make sure that that was consistent. 
And the other one is ease of use. We wanted to make sure as things came in that it was the solution was simple to implement and simple to make changes. So in the model, having a profile that describes how you're going to mass the data, and that was an important requirement as well. Next slide. Um, environments, we wanted to make sure that at least for management of data, that all the SDLCs I mentioned was before, each environment has that same data set masked the same way. And a file I load in SID can also be the one I load in dev, could be the one I load in any other of the other environments. I don't have to I don't have to create new scenarios or new data sets. I can use that same file in each one and make sure it'll work the same way. And then the speed, I talked about how fast we can do it. How fast can we mass the data and how fast can we move that data into each of the environments? All of those were important considerations because we want our SDLC to continue to work. So now we want to talk about how do you accomplish this? So there were several things that you have to consider. So first we have to build confidence in the process that we're doing. Because one of the things that we came across was people like, well, you're taking away my production data. Well, how am I going to test? What am I going to do? So you have to tackle that through these multiple steps in the process. So first, you have to identify who your SMEs are. You want to make sure you get the right people to identify what data needs to get de-identified. Where does your PHI live? It doesn't always live in the most obvious places, especially if you remap columns. You have to have that identification to be able to make sure you get the right data. Uh, and just to interject there, one of the things to keep in mind, like in facets, sometimes we'll take multiple PHI fields and glom them together to create something else. And so those are things that you need to watch out for, is it may look like a key that is really a piece of PHI based off of the data from the other parts of the system. The other thing that becomes critical in your initiation phase is to identify where all of your data lives. As with most organizations, things grow over time, and so things get put all over the place. So identifying where all of that data lives, which of those systems are truly your source systems. Some of them may be downstream, and all you have to do is connect up to the de-identified data, and that will automatically then propagate. Some of those are truly source systems. So that process of identifying that is critical. And then identifying where you want to start. So the, there's a good phrase that Mark likes to use, which is perfection is the enemy of good, right? So trying to make sure that you're getting 100% all the time will stop you from getting something done. So identify and prioritize which are your foundational systems, what are your critical areas that lead you to success, and then be able to build from there. In the execution phase, one of the things that we've identified is your non-database sources really become a problem, especially in healthcare, because we still deal with a ton of flat files. So where do those live? And again, it becomes an evaluation. What are the ones that are inbound? Your outbound ones will already be de-identified because of the process that's pulling from a database. But which ones are inbound? And then of those inbound files, which ones are truly PHI, which ones may not contain PHI? So all of this evaluation is a large effort of going through and scoping and identifying and, and analyzing your data. Tracking and documentation is critical here to make sure that as you go through and identify, while well, we're not going to de-identify this particular column, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but an example is date of birth, right? We couldn't de-identify date of birth because there were certain processes that depended upon that complexity and in initial, so you can only de-identify the day. Well, understanding that, identifying that, documenting those decisions are critical because when an auditor comes in, you want to be able to explain why you made the decision, what the process is to, to protect. And that is the important part is that the mindset of this whole thing is around confidence, but at the end of the day, it's got to be a usable system. It doesn't make any sense to mask every piece of PHI and then the system's not usable. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we, that's part of the mindset to get people into is because they'll be like, well, if you mask everything, then how am I going to do X? And be like, well, if we have something that we can't mask because it will affect this, then we're going to, we will have an exception because it's better to not mask 95% of your data than zero. So let's get mask and then have a useful environment and then have a logical argument as to why that's where it is. Do you have a question? Oh. I thought I saw a hand. Um, and then validation, right? So again, as part of the process of building the confidence, you have to have a solid testing strategy to make sure that when you're done, that the organization believes and trusts in what you have accomplished. So defining the, trust, the testing strategy and getting a baseline that will provide the protection are the key elements 
and making sure that you get to success. Yeah. Before you jump off this slide, remember this is the pilot. So this is not the actual rollout. This is taking an environment. It is masking the data, masking the data sources, figuring out where everything is, and executing in that environment to say have everybody see that it works. We have not, in, at this point, you have not yet rolled it out to all your environments. You've just done it in this one to build that confidence. And that, that's what we did. Yeah. And it also gives you the opportunity to find where all your problems are going to be. Correct. So you get to identify where your issues are. And then by the time you're rolling it out, those right. issues have been resolved. And now, yeah, and now we go to the rollout. So once the process is established, so once you've gone through the pilot, you feel confident that you know what's going to happen. Now you can roll it out. So you're utilizing your, your learnings from your pilot. You're creating a communication plan. And this is critical because, again, if you don't communicate and you don't have a plan for how you're going to implement it, the organization will be lost. There's already a paradigm shift going on. There's already some unsteadiness and uneasiness. So the communication plan is critical to make sure that they understand and come along with you as you change. Training approach and materials, again, how are you going, how's your world changing? What's happening in your non-prod? Now that you're changing, are you locking folks out of production? What will that look like? What will their world be? How do you have those handoffs? All of those things have to be defined. And getting to success, and again, the idea is doing things incremental. What are your primary SDLC environments? You may have a number of different ones as we did, so what do you want to start with? You want to start with the ones that may not be necessarily accessed all the time to bring your SDLC to a halt. Move into those smaller environments, give your organization opportunity again to build confidence. And then once you've done that, roll it out into your primary environments. And that gives you the best opportunity for success. Execute. Once you're building into these ancillary environments, once you've gone through now you have your primary SDLC environments, your intake of new data sources. So how are these go how are you is your organization going to adjust to the changing data? Whether it's the databases, whether it's new flat files, what are those processes that you will now follow to ingest and make sure that you keep the environments de-identified? Yeah, and that's an item we had to add to our project um, checklist is, you know, everybody's got like, what's our development need? What's our testing need? What's our, you know, business need and config or whatever. You have to add now, add a line to that plan to say, what's my data de 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 identification needs? Because if that project has a new database or it's an upgrade where there's a schema change or it's a new flat file for a vendor you're sending eligibility to, you're going to have to build that into your plan. And so adding that to your project checklist, it makes it so everybody thinks about that as they're going through the process. And that was... That was a mindset change because everybody was flipping out. Like, well, now I've got a data. How do I do that? I'm like, same way you do it if we needed to build an, uh, an extract for eligibility. You have a line on there. It says, do you need an eligibility extract? Yes, put in time to build it. Is there an eligibility extract? Put in time to de-identify it. I mean, that's the pieces. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Of course. Um, say you have a, you know, you de-identified all your data. You brought it down to a development region. Somebody takes an 834. They don't de-identify it, and they load into that region. Bob, do you have any safeguards to stop real data from going into a de-identified environment? Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that briefly. So one of the things that we did is we've set up uh, more of an automated process. So what happens is there is a limited subset of people that can grab production data files from the archive. They then place those into a folder. That folder then pulls them out and puts them into an outbound, uh, de-identifies and dumps them in an outbound folder where everybody can pick that one up. So the idea is that you've got this small group of people that can grab the files, everybody can get them from here. So the only way somebody does that is one of those people that have very special permissions up here to grab a file, grabs a file and just loads it straight in. And that's about the best we can get to, but the but it seems to be a- I tell you, that's not good enough. The best- that's, that's what that's, to us. that's what we're doing right now, um, and you know we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do. The the problem really boils down to, and I didn't want to get into this because this is outside of data identification. But one of the ones is to put systems in place where people have you know um, different logins for running specific jobs and things like that. So it's very difficult for them to do that. 
Um, but again, we are in the beginnings of this uh, at the at the starting point of having this be in place and working through it. So well, I'm sure we're going to run into those. And when they happen, we're going to see what other controls we can put in place. Mm -hmm. But you said it happens to you. So do you have a do you have a model yet you guys are using? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> We're not happy with it. Yeah, so we're, we're not. Oh. Yeah. I mean, we're, I'd, I'd love to say we have a perfect model. We don't. And that's the whole thing. Perfect is the enemy of good. We, it's better than it was. We have some controls in place. They're not perfect. But for the most part, everybody knows I only get my files I loaded in on prod from here. And only these, you know, five, ten people can pull the files from Pry, and that's the model. It seems like if this is important enough to an organization, they need, as you were saying, add it as a line item. Maybe that also includes adding, uh, if you will, a resource to structure around some security yeah. measures so that you can prevent that kind of stuff. Because what she's talking about is we look, we have X number of markets and we have nine different analysts that are involved at any given point on any day needing to do testing. Right. Against these, let's just say 25 markets. Well, you've got nine people needing to pull files. Well, but that you can't restrict yeah. those nine people down to one or two. Well, that's right. That the test data for, but that's why we automated the process because if you automate the process, they can just say, hey, I need this file. And the person goes, grabs it, dumps it in the folder, and it automatically processes. So semi Yeah, somebody somebody still grabs the file and yeah, somebody's grabbing the file and throwing it in but but and it's processed. Not de identified, just processed. Right, but but that's why you make it so there is a very, very small number of people that can do the file. As an organization, you have to decide how are you going to control that and if that control means you add another resource to be compliant. With this, then you have well, to add that resource, well, that overhead. And that was the big thing where we said we don't want to add a lot of time to the S2C process. And that's why we automated that conversion process. Because by doing that, the pro the amount of time it takes you to, you basically, you ask for file. If you're a person who can do it, if you're one of the handful, you could actually grab the file mode yourself. But the idea is you have a handful of trusted people. And then you've got everybody else can only grab from the de-identified folder. So they have no ability to do it. So you go from having the possibility of everybody in the company grabbing a file or everybody in the test environment, whatever, to now it's down to one, two, three people, whatever that number is. But it's 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 a fraction of what it was before. Because right now, or, or before this, you know, we had, you know, dozen test people that could go grab a production file and load it into the environment. And now that... The, the two people that can do that. You know, what are you taking? One's on vacation. What do you do? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's other, there's there's other people, but it's not their job that have that access. But it's not their job to do it, but they can fill in. Yes, sir. Yeah, I apologize. I'm slow, and I'm like five slides back. No worries. I'm just curious. The argument between DID and obfuscation. Yeah. Could, can you just help me with that? I'm still not super crisp on why you chose one over the other. Yeah, so at least from our standpoint, obfuscation is like you take a black marker and drag it across a sentence. You can't read it. That masking, means, though. Okay, we'll say that. Yeah, masking is the same thing. Masking basically destroys the data. There's, there's, it's, it's something there that is not representative and not necessarily unique. It is just it's gone. So I'll use Delphix as an example. Right. It, it scrambles. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's not a black marker, but. But the, but it but it does it in a way that it retains the structure of the the data. We actually that's what we use is Delphix. It retains a structure. So names still look like names. Dates yeah. still look like dates. You know, various things. Birthdays can still look like birthdays. All of those that structure is maintained. Oh um, Delphix has a library of first names, so you can do masking, and then first names can still look like first names, but they're not the same name. Um, that's different than, you know, pure random. Now, we, we have stuff like notes fields on claims and stuff like that. We just we just scramble those. We don't okay. need those to be, you know, lipsum, orum, whatever that thing is. Yeah. Yeah. Underpinning all of this, though, you're using Delphic. Yes, correct. In our case, yes, we are. We were trying to be agnostic on that because yeah, well, the, the tool is when people want to use. Oh, that's fair. That's yeah. Fair. Um, but, yeah, so that's what we do. But, but right. in your case, but what you're talking about, the, the big thing was is that it's 
it's pretty simple to just mass data. The problem is if I just mass the data and then I get a new file in, how do I make sure that member matches up with the member in the system? If you're masking, I can't match them up because the data is gone and it's not necessarily unique or specific. With data de-identification, you know, this user ID is still looks like a user ID and it matches this one. And that was a big thing is it's repeatable. I can mask member ID, you know, 11111471159, whatever, and it masks to the same thing or uh, de-identifies the same thing every time. So my 834s come in the same way and my claims come in the same way and they still match up because that data matches. And that's why at the beginning we wanted to get that terminology straight, right? Because there is a fuzzy line between somebody saying masking mean DID, somebody yeah. saying DID mean masking, right? So that's why we wanted to correct that terminology, yeah, yeah. right? So it takes me a while to no, 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 that's okay. But 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 it, you're emphasizing you're emphasizing the reason why you want to make sure that you get your terminology correct, so that you make sure you are following. And we started from the thought process is we want to have an SDLC environment that works basically the way it does now. We want to minimize the impact to the people doing the work, and we want to make sure that it is timely and effective in delivering. And those are kind of the key points. And we wanted to make sure it was a robust data set because if it's not a robust data set, then people are not going to have confidence that my testing looks good. So those things were all in place. So we just systematically just tried to make sure we met each one of those. And, and Delphix was the tool that we ended up going with. But you know, I, again, I'll be agnostic. If there's a tool out there that does those things, then, you know, that would would have been one we'd look at too. I'm paying the bill for Delphix right now. Yeah. So that's why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things with Delphix that we found that was, that was helpful was the fact that it did flat files yeah. and the HL7s, right? So it gave you that uniformity across all of your various inputs. Um, so yeah, probably similar, similar reason why you so does Delphix allow configuration as to how things are masked or de-identified? Yeah, you have you have structures associated with it. So like you can say, hey, I want to mask something within these ranges. Like I, whatever the value that comes in, it needs to be between this and this. So we had some situations. I'm trying to remember if it was on member IDs or something, but we said like, hey, member IDs below this number or special ones don't touch for various reasons. They're like non-real production members. Yeah. And then these need to not mask outside this range. And then these can be masked, can't mask into the slower range. So we have, you can do models like that. Yeah. And you can also customize your algorithm. And I keep saying mask. We, we've we used that interchangeably. I mean, the identified. <laughs> Every time I say mask, every time I say mask, I'm going to get more with it. Yeah. Yes, sir. When you said V, I'm just not clear. What does that mean, V? Is it a cognizant? I think we Oh, no. I, I, I'm sorry. You may have. I, I may not have been yeah, I'm I'm uh, with CEPHP. I'm a health plan. Uh, oh. We're we're a health plan out of upstate New York. We have about four hundred thousand members, and um, you know we worked with our system integrator SourceEdge to implement uh, this solution. So it's a completely different product than what Cognizant. Or Cognizant. This is not Delphix right. is not a Cognizant product. Correct. Because we have we do use the product called um, the data masking tool. Yeah, from yeah. Is it? Right, so it's and, completely different. And yeah. keep in mind, we touched on this again in the beginning. I'm not sure if you were here. Yeah, just... Data masking, very appropriate, can certainly be used. Our requirements and our plan were such that data masking um, or, or, or um, using some sort of hash table or something to create data that was unwindable was not acceptable to our security team. And so they said, you need something more than that that cannot be unwound, that can't be backed out. Somebody can't take the data and the key and turn that into data. So that was the change. Perfectly, I mean, using fastest encryption and the masking tools that, it, that, that Cognizant have, totally valid. In our particular case, it didn't meet the full requirement for machine security. Because, I mean, it has its own limitations. So. Right. Correct. Everything has its limitations. Everything's got its own set of issues. Um, we can go on, I guess. Yeah, great so, question. By the way, thank yeah. you. Please interject at any time. But I think these last two points really cover a lot of the conversation we're having, which is you have to have your production and non-production access controls defined. It's it's a critical aspect, and it has to fit the behavior of your organization. To your point. Yeah. So, um, and making sure your daily operational workflow in these environments are updated to fit now the new toss of the new paradigm shift. If the shop collars were a big expense. <laughs> yeah. 
and um, altering mindset. So we touched on this a little bit. I mean, the big thing is you need to get people to think differently because people, I mean, and I don't know about you guys, but I've worked with a lot of health plans and almost every health plan, people have been there for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, and they've been doing things the same way every time forever. And the minute you say, I'm going to change, you're going to use de-identified data, they're like, but if I have a problem with member X in production, how am I going to find them in non-prod? How do I go find them? And I'm like, well, you, you won't be able to find them. That's the whole point. And they're like, well, then what do I do? And I said, you're going to have to look at what about that member? Now, there are going to be situations, I'll touch on that in a second, but there are going to be situations where you really need to look at that specific member and you need an opportunity to, to look in a lower environment at that. And I'll talk about that in one second. But the big thing is around people nervous about them not seeing production data. Um, you know, they feel that, you know, what they're going to do is not going to work the way they expect. That's a big deal. And it's not something you can ignore because your problem isn't going to be the technology. Your problem is going to be the people fighting you tooth and nail. And I can't do this if you do X. And sometimes you have to really listen closely because sometimes they got a really good point. You know, we mentioned date of birth. You can't mass date of birth and turn a 17-year-old into a 42-year-old. That's going to cause problems. Um, you know, you've got things like that you have to address. In our case, because we're a regional plan and New York has some very specific rules, we had to not mass county and zip codes, even though that's considered PHI. We can't mass them because if we do, it starts breaking down a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Part of that. We have New York as a Medicaid market, and we do de-identify the do? zip code and county, I believe. Is it working well for you? Okay, well, we, we weren't able to figure out how to do it. As long as your rates aren't uh, on zip codes. Our, ours are driven by zip codes and counties. We looked up, so we were running into the issues there, but, but I don't know. And is it you're, you're talking more from a commercial perspective? Or? Um, I, I have to admit, I'm not super okay. clear on that. I'm just wondering, yeah, I'm just wondering if that is the difference. Well, we'd have commercial okay. and, and uh, okay. Medicaid and Medicare. Okay. So it's, it's all of those. Um. But we want to build confidence. You have to, and, and I will tell you, this this is probably the biggest thing that trips you up. Once you get through the technical piece, this is what trips you up, is people fighting you tooth and nail about this isn't going to work, I don't like it, it's not going to work. So every step of the way, we want to document what we're doing, high level of communication, and that's what we did in our, our system to make sure that they understand how they can accomplish daily tasks. And we listen closely because if there is something that can't be done, that we need to work with them to make it. Because at the end of the day, the system has to be usable. Doesn't have to be 100% mask. If it's 100% mask and unusable, then there's no point in the prior to do uh, Let me ask. Let me go back as a clarifying point, and I don't know if this is a, this capability is available. But we didn't actually mask zip code and county. What we did is we de-identified a member. If let's say they lived in zip code one two three four five, well, in that county, we would have picked a specific address mm. in that county and every member within that zip code range move got that address. just moved that same single address mm. so everybody in the county got to the same zip code and same same address but that's not but that's not de but that's not county but that's not de-identifying because the de-identifying is that this member and this county are associated with each other if that member is still in that county even if the member is de-identified you have a de-identified county or zip You've de-identified the member, but not the county or zip. The county or zip are still the same for that, that de-identified member. That's true. I mean, but so we, our... we de-identified the member, which is what you guys did, but we, and de-identified their address, but the zip and county are the same. Same thing we did. Which is what you guys have done. Yeah, that's you guys what we did. Yeah, we did de identify. I was like, going, if you guys did that, I might want to ask you how you did that. Because Yeah, well, that's the thing. We had to build somebody actually manually build a crosswalk of here's every single zip code within every single state for a county and mapped it to and picked an address in within that county for every single state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, we, yeah. And so, okay. If you're at one, two, three, four, five zip code, you're going to and, and not to nine. And, and, and the short answer is that works. Yeah. And but you really you're de-identifying almost identically to what we did. We asked the address, de-identified the address, and then the county and zip stayed the same. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Big point. And thank you for bringing it up. I mean, I was about to. I was like making a note to myself. No, they did that. <laughs> now I feel better. <laughs> I want to say there's something like what 14 identifiable ashes, right? And 18, yeah, 18, I think. Yes. 18. Yeah, that was close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I will say for and I I mean if if we are legally like for us we have contractual obligations yeah. to yeah, yeah, yeah. of it, right? So I think many in, are in that same scenario. Zip is on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we, so we specifically, so what we did, this goes into our documentation piece, which is we very specifically, when we had to retain a piece of the data element to enable the system to still work, we documented the rationale behind it. We ran into our um, steering committee, which has our legal team on it and our security team on it and said, here's the decision we're making and why, because we can't have an unusable non-production environment. So we, and that goes into the documentation one. Every time we vary, and what we did is we took the um, HIPAA matrix of everything that's considered PHI and everything that's on that list, we either de-identified it. In the case of data births, we partially de-identified it. Yeah, we did the same. And then just a day. for everything yeah. else, there was either yes, it's de-identified or like county and zip is the best example. We didn't de-identify it. And we documented that, and we so we've got we've got a very crisp answer to what did you do and why. So you know, and our legal team weighed in on it. And that was the big thing: is making sure that the legal and security teams, every step of the way, said yes, that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Um, but it's not perfect, and that was the whole point. If you want perfect, then we stop the project now, because well, it's, it's that a, technicality of are you compliant or not. Well, and, but we felt, that, and that's why we have legal right. then, because they're the ones you're going to have to make the argument. And if they don't feel it's a good argument, then they'll tell us to yeah. do that. Right. Yeah. But the other piece of it, too, is under an audit, right? If the auditor comes in and sees at least you made an effort, right, versus we didn't do anything because we couldn't do it all, you get no credit, right? right. So at least at least what you get, if they don't like it, you get an action item. Yeah. And then you got to go figure out what to do with it. Right. But at least you got something functional and you've protected yourself from the vast majority of things that can expose you. And then when the auditor comes in, that's the negotiation, right? The arm wrestling with the auditor, you know, where, where you're going to end up, right? So we accept that that's going to be part of the process. But again, the idea is perfection is the enemy of good, right? So like get to good and figure out when, when the auditor comes, if they don't accept it, then you deal with that. And that's a whole separate project, but at least you're 90% of the way there. And then you can figure out the gap. And I can't count how many times we had the discussion of like, I can de-identify this piece of data, but then all of these test scenarios won't necessarily be valid. And is that worth it? And the answer is no, it's not. Let's leave that. And that way we can continue to have a valid case. But again, it's in, th- this is a decision on a case-by-case basis, depending on your plan and your benefit models and all the other stuff and how you've set all that up. But um you know, that goes into making sure you document everything. And it's also documenting the process changes. Like you said, how do I get my flat files masked, de-identified? How do I treat each of those pieces? Let's make sure I get those right. Um, the one thing that we did, which I think is incredibly valuable, is we did add to our SDLC. Before SDLC went dev, integration, QA, production. We have inserted between prod and QA a pre-production environment that is unmasked. It is a copy of production with very limited access, which allows people going through the process with their process or whatever, and then it can be installed there, and then that limited subset of people can run a test through that environment before it goes to prod, and that builds that confidence. Now, I don't know if we'll ever get rid of that, but right now we have it in place because that lets people see over and over again, my unmasked data works the same as my production data, and as they build that confidence, they stop asking with questions. Because you can't tell people to not worry. You have to show them they don't have to worry. So how well, are you guys refreshing your non-prods from production? And are you doing the de-identification as you refresh to non-prod or after? Correct. So um, the way that we're doing the process is right now our refresh process, or I'm sorry, b- before this, our refresh process was almost annually. With this process, we're looking at, we're doing it in about every three to four months. And the way that works is we grab a copy of production, we mask that data. It goes through data. De-identify. De-identify. I would think of the same thing. De-identify, thank you. Um, De-identify that data. Now we're using a virtual database, VDB. And so the VDB, there's the, and you can probably describe this better, but there's there's a Delta database stored with each environment. And so when we put the database in there that has the mask data, this mask identically to the last one, and then that delta change is is associated with that. So 
members that you have loaded into that environment are still there and you're able to have most of your tests still work the way you expected them to work. So as you're doing it that often, is there any concerns about data integrity as you continue to use the production data and masking it in? Not, not at this point that we've seen. How long have you been doing it? Um, we've been doing it a few months. But how many different databases do you have beyond Fastings? Well, that that's we've got a few. Um, we have our uh, enterprise data warehouse, and the enterprise data warehouse is also masked. But uh, DNA, I uh, identify. <laughs> see, I'll get everybody to correct me. Um, and then we have several others. We've got For the warehouse. Do you do a reload, or you do a cool? Well, there are parts. Of, there are parts of it that are loaded. Like there's copies of facets schemas in there, and those are loaded to the copy that we just that we just de-identified. There's other other schemas that we are de-identifying from scratch. We have downstream systems like a data lake that's loaded with you know, data that comes into them. Um, we do have EDM, but we we actually EDM is excluded because we use the non-product environment to send off test files. So that one we've just restricted access down because we can't mask that data and still use it the way it needs to be done. So that one's been set aside. But that's something that we have in place. Um, but there's there's a few, and that's one so thing. We also use, you know. was, there's a Salesforce connector for Delphix, and so we're using that. And so it actually um, de-identifies the data in the Salesforce the same way it does in facets. And the last piece is, I guess, well, I... It's a sequence, but yes. But Salesforce is a bit tricky, and so it's a bit painful there, but we don't have that in every single environment. Um, the one thing I would mention real quick is we do have Mesos, and the way we've done Mesos is we have, there's nothing in Mesos. We de-identify data, and then we load, um, we run the processes that build the folders using mass data to, or de-identify data to create the folder name. And then we run the batch jobs that use pulling the data and build the, the letters and stuff, so all that data is in there masked. So instead of copying Mesos from production, we use that non-prod one to populate the other lower environments. How does yeah. that keep it current? Harder. How does that keep it current with what's in production? It doesn't keep it current with what's in production. That's one of the downsides, which is why we have the environment at the very end that has a copy of Mesos Thank and God. production data, so you can run a test there if for whatever reason you, you don't feel confident in the other environments. But you're able to test the basics of it, and then if you need a, the final test for full prod, you've got it there. And just to add to that. But yeah, I love these questions because these are exactly the questions everybody on our technical team asked all along this. Well, how are you doing refreshes and how are you doing this? So this is great stuff. Hold on. You had a question, sir? Yeah. So this is basically nothing to do with um, the fastest data this, right? It can be. It can be any. It can be anything, right? It can be any data. And how is the referential integrity is maintained? Is it part of the already the system or we need to configuration or we need to. Steve, you probably can handle this. Yeah, so the referential integrity is maintained by your by by the tool and the fact that your keys, if you de-identify the key, the key is always de-identified the same way. So that key that gets referenced in table A and table B and table C, when it gets de-identified, it gets de-identified such that the, the data integrity or the referential integrity is still maintained. I'm assuming you're building models for each of these tables and you have to pick the same de-identification rule. Well, it's a profile, right? Yeah, yeah that's profile. exactly. Yeah, there's okay. a profile and an algorithm. For so each, pro each table and has exactly. its own profile. You've configured it to say for this this field, use this de-identification method or right. algorithm, algorithm. That's right. to do whatever, whether it's a number or uh, alphanumeric or it's a name specifically. Okay. You've got certain algorithms that handle different. And you do have to pick, to your point, you do have to pick the same algorithm yes, to want the same result, yeah. right? You so can build two different profiles and they have, those profiles have the same val same field. If you use a different algorithm for those same fields, you're not going to get the results. That's right. Correct. So that means we need to build the profiles. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, profile building is the big thing. We talked about that at the beginning is that ensuring that you have a process to build something that is repeatable, um, you got to get that in place. And so every new flat file we bring in or every new scheme yeah. change, we have to go back and revisit the profile and make sure that those particular fields are continuing to follow the profile we've been using all along. Okay. Yes, sir. Do we, anything with the uh, images in Mesos or do you all use it? We, we, for the de-identification purposes, we cored out Mesos. We just have an empty Mesos system. Oh. And then what we did is we then refresh the database, then we ran our folder build process, which built all the folder using mass IDs for all of the folder names, because you know they're tied to member IDs and group IDs of this guy. So that's all built. 
then we run like the letter gen process, which then goes and grabs the data out of the system and generates the, the outbound letters and puts those in the folders. So we only have data that's generated from mass data in that environment. We do not run any formwork stuff to load in digitized images or anything like that. That's, a, that's one of our gotchas we talk about later is anything where you've got data like that, we don't have any good solution for that. So we're working around it. And that's part of the reason we're putting the environment at the end that's unmasked that had full Mesa space in there. So we run through, we get a good test. So just add on one more question. No, no, that's it. You're hit your mistakes. <laughs> Go ahead. No. So part of the, you know, everyday day-to-day -day life, you know, we keep on adding the new tables. Yeah. Uh, right? yeah. Yeah. So it's not like I cannot go update the profile. Is it expected to go update the profile every single day? Then? Well, profiles shouldn't need to be updated every day because your profile is going to be associated with a database schema. And if you're updating your database schema every single day, that's a concern. Yeah, that's something to go on. I'm adding that extra table. As you add tables. Yeah, every, but time, you, you, every time you add a table, every time, we have, every time you change the schema, you're going to have to go revisit that profile. If yeah. you're doing that every day, then... That's a whole mindset change. So you might not be able to keep the same profile as IT. Do too many teams involved. You know, everybody has their own. So it looks right. like they need then, to do that. Right. But you only but you're only refreshing quarterly, right? So you don't have to do it that I okay. But you, you follow what I'm saying, right? So the point at which you have to address that is the point at which you're doing the refresh to figure out where your deltas are. Right. Right. So but, even though you're making ch daily changes you're going to have to come up with a process that tracks what those changes are such that when you do the refresh. I, I, I do want to emphasize by no means saying we wanted the SDLC process to work smoothly is by no means to say we want the SDLC process and everything to be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. There are changes. There is an overhead associated with de-identifying the data. There's an overhead associated with profiling the data. You're going to have to build that into your process. If you're changing adding tables every day, then you need to build a process where you do it once a month and once a quarter, because if you're doing it every year, you're, you're not going to have time to change if, et cetera. So it's a process change and that goes into the mindset. Now, people back to that. The hardest part after the core de-identification process is the mindset change of your business process has to change and how you work with this has to change. You see, if you add a few, add a field or to that matter, a column, you're adding it to, in your you want to build it through each one of the Correct. environments anyway. You're doing it the same way you did before, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Well, it's no, it is, I, until, you, until you come and do a complete refresh or you're feeding a new file. And it's right. Me or file feed, but you usually make those changes in it. Yeah. And yeah, you're, you're doing it in one, right? So the virtualized database allows you to propagate those throughout all the environments. So your structural changes are happening. So the way that, the way that it's built is you have your unmasked master, right? So that can be refresh daily right and, and kept there when you do your quarterly refreshes that's the point at which you're going to rerun your profiles make your adjustments that will get pulled into your master or, or de-identified master and then from there what happens is you propagate those databases out as vdbs so you're not making them individually changes you're doing a master child relationship does that make sense and flat files are just simple because you just go and you say, oh, there's a new flat file. You put a file, you run it through, run it in the system, and you're done. So those can be done any time. But, um, yeah, there's a there's an overhead associated with that. Um, we talked about parallel environments. Um, we just, for example, on-call procedures, production triage if you're limiting access because, like, people might be used to, oh, I have a problem in prod. Oh, I'm going to go grab this file and run it through non-prod. You need to be careful about people. And, again, that's around the control and access, yeah. et cetera. Um, you know, you're going to have emergency changes. People are like, oh, I'm going to get changing right away. It's one of the reasons we put that unmasked environment there is when you need something right now, we don't, oh, no, we don't have an environment with unmasked data, so it's going to take us, you know, four days to get that set up for you. No, we want to have that ready for them right then. Um, the refresh process, we just talked about getting people understanding what that means. And, um, you know, if we run into a problem, we might have to blow everything away and redo it. But so far, we haven't had that. I cross our fingers. And daily operations, again, that goes to the point about how do people get stuff done? They're bringing in some limited number of people are now having access to certain files. It's not everybody on the in the, in the IT team. Next slide. So um, I think this was yours, right? Yeah. Yep. So we wanted to summarize kind of what the checklist is. So repeatable and consistent. So we want to make sure that as your data is masked or de-identified, 
that it's consistent in all of your environments, whether it comes from a flat file in 837 and 834 or a database or Salesforce. It's consistent and it's done the same way so that you have the referential integrity throughout your environments, not just inside your databases. And the complexity and richness, again, this is critical because especially if people are used to having full access to production, it's gonna be very difficult for them to not only shift, but then to have less data is gonna throw them over the edge. So having that available is critical critical to the success. And consistent and usable in all the environments. So again, if you're looking at similar data sets, your similar results, you shouldn't go from dev to test and have completely different results because your data sets change. So it gives you consistency in your environments because there's consistency in the data. Performance, so quick and efficient. So you don't want a significant delay in your refresh process. You want to take weeks. It should be, you know, for things that you're doing regularly, like flat files, should be minutes, hours for a full refresh should be, you know, still in the hours range, but maybe a day or two is what you're looking for for that, uh, for that process. Building the confidence, again, as Dan talked about, paradigm shift, it's a mindset change, making sure that you bring your organization with you. Spending the time on the rollout, the next step, making sure that as you go through the environments, one of the things we found is each of these environments are configured slightly differently. What do you have in these environments? What needs to be tailored in this specific environment that you don't have someplace else? Making sure that that's pulled together. And again, altering the mindset. Make sure that they have confidence. One of the biggest problems you have is you roll out, you spend all kinds of money on it, but the organization doesn't use it. There's nobody trusts that there's the data. So you have to build that confidence. Yeah, it, it, yeah, everybody was like, well, I need access to the unmasked data because I need to be able to de-identify data. Identify with data. I need to be able to access that because blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, it, this smaller group. In our situation, actually, the going to the uh, performance issue, de-identifying an environment is right now, what, weeks? For them to just take a copy of production and actually de-identify it. Yeah, and it's not a full blown. And then, and then trying to get them to put it, have a cr that recent copy put into a lower environment so that we can actually do this testing. So we wind up, a lot of us wind up finding a identified environment mm -hmm. that's in a lower that we can use for tests. And that's where we wind up doing our focus testing yeah. because we can't trust the identified data because it's 18 months out of date. Yeah. yeah. There can't ever get to the end. No. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have similar concerns but fortunate we've been able to like the de-identification process very quick and then we vdb the environment in there and then just you know we might have to run some processes to like i said rerun processes to generate the folders etc and copy mesas and stuff so there's steps in there it's not hours as right. steve happily noted but it but it's days of work um but it's not it's not it's about the same as it was before it's just now we know that that database we put in our test environment is the same as the one that's in the dev environment is the same as the one the UAQA environment. And then we take the, the process we have, we have an ingested copy of the production database. So we have a copy of unmasked data sitting right next to the copy of masked data. And that is the one that goes into that last environment that's unmasked. So all of the data in all those environments is as we finish a refresh. I think we have like, some of that staging stuff. We have the... Yeah, uh, original production. Yeah, and we have our masked data. We we'll call yeah. gold copy. I think is what yep. they wound up calling it. So we have that. It's our struggle is more about getting that gold copy created. That's what takes weeks mm -hmm. right now to process to create. And I think and it was, currently takes like two days, seventy hours. It's uh, seventy-seven hours for about twenty-three terabytes of data. Thank just you. to just to and I don't know what ours is. Right. So, so, yeah. um, two is you kind of leaking. For, okay, yeah, so we have millions. Yeah, yeah. we can have, yeah. Yeah, we, we do not have millions. Yeah. Do you guys have a technical slide or a logical slide that you can share? Um, I, Not in this debt. Yeah, but you, we can, I can, I can get you a logical slide. Yeah, yeah. You know, Source Edge has, has a lot of that stuff that's genericized that you can provide to you. So, um, <laughs> the Yale Miner is the last bottom of this if you have to. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah, let's go to the last slide, or second to last slide here. Um. You want to hit this? Yeah, sure. 
Uh, hard coding. That was one of the initial ones that we hit because you don't discover that this is a problem because everybody's using production data. So the fact that stuff was hard coded didn't matter. Well, now it matters. So now you've got to take coding can be hard coded or a parameter based off a table that somebody has like built out somewhere. So it's it's either of those two models. You've got to figure that out. Yeah. And so that's what we ended up doing is do more, doing more of a data driven process to replace those hard coded uh, filtering. A lot of data types, as we talked about with Maces, right? So your images, that's not something that we chose to address. There are things out there that may be able to address it, but again, perfection is the enemy of good, right? Get what you can get done, take on the more complex issues. And, and to be clear, we did address it. We just addressed it by not migrating that data in and just right. creating it from scratch. Um, data, data integrity. So this is what we're talking about with date of service, year of birth, zip codes, there may be certain things that you have to create uh, exceptions for based on your business processes. Um, defining what's clearly in scope, again, in our case, non-member data. So we dis the decision was that for your providers, that's out of scope. So you can limit directly just your member data and the PHI that may assist in, in getting- I, I think we want 10, yeah. PHI. Yeah. yeah, we did yes. fine 10. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we, again, we we took the HIPAA with a guideline list and ran it past our security and legal team and said, you know, here's what we think. And they had one or two that they said add those back in. So that's the list we followed. And I can't, I don't have it memorized off the top of my head, but that's what we utilize. So again, we just took every step of the way, made sure that we had legal and security bio. And then technical debt, right? As you go through and start to go through these environments you may have to address technical debt that you were happily able to ignore in the past. So you got to make sure that what that is up front, so that becomes part of your discovery and your evaluation to make sure what you need to do to address that technical debt to make sure that the process is successful. Yep. And that's the show. Other questions? Yes, sir. So do you have... Uh... As developers, a lot of times we're going to be troubleshooting issues. You got production issues. A lot of times those issues are caused by the data. And so if we're scrubbing that, if we're changing special characters, et cetera, that and gone, it's not reproducible now in your lower environments where you've removed that. So does this necessitate you still have to have a carbon copy of prod somewhere? Well, we made the decision to do so for two reasons. One is we wanted to build confidence with the people doing this process that what they saw happen in a de-identified environment would work the same in prod before it got prod. And the second reason was to address exactly that issue. You've got a problem in prod, you try it in, an, in a mask environment and can't replicate it, so you go to that copy of prod that has limited access and have somebody run it there. This, this way I guess I worry about is in the end, does it just necessitate everyone ends up needing access? We, we restrict that down very, because quite honestly, you know, and I've got better part of 15 years of experience doing production support in facets environments. And my experience has been that that's less than 10% of your issues in production. Real time require that kind of data access. It, you know, usually those that have to be addressed like right that minute. You have issues in production that need that analysis, but those happen in the day and those take days to work through. But if you have a problem at night, something just stops working. That's usually an access issue. It's a permissions issue. It's a crash server. The file is just not there at all and typically doesn't require a person real time in the middle of the night to go look at data. And if they do, then you pick up the non-call and get somebody to go work in that other environment. You have that special subset of restricted, if it's going to be yeah. a data-related issue. Yeah. Sorry, y'all can't troubleshoot it. That's, that's, right. that's, a pro, that's when I list you on there of process changes. Production operations is one of the ones where you do have to put those changes in place unless you just want to open it to everybody. And if you open it to everybody, then there's no point. And again, it goes back to usability. There are changes and that's the mindset. Everybody wants to argue that, you know, they're special and, and they have to have this. And there are some that are, but uh, any other questions? Now, 